and I'm the director of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. We're so pleased to see you all here this evening. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the council or our members, we're dedicated to fostering learning, discussion, and citizen involvement in world affairs around the state through educational programs like this one, and our International Visitors Program, which brings nearly 300 emerging leaders from around the globe to New Hampshire each year. It's never been more critical to ensure our communities are globally literate, and we are giving you the tools to learn more about your world. Our headline speaker series, Free and Open to the Community, is one of those opportunities. This spring, we're tackling global tipping points, from Africa to Russia, from poverty to security, with three experts on world affairs. We would also like to invite you to check out the Back of Your Blue program for other upcoming events including a visit from the Estonian ambassador discussing the country's first year in the tumultuous Eurozone, a discussion about Africa's political emancipation beyond aid and dependency, and the keystone of our year, the Global Forum. This year, Senator George Mitchell, former US Special Envoy for Middle East Peace under President Obama, will be joining us for this fundraiser, taking place on Monday, April 23rd. Tonight, we'd like to thank those that make this critical work possible, especially our co-presenter of this series, UNH Manchester, and its History and Humanities programs, and our series sponsor, Amoskeg Airport Service. But in order to continue connecting New Hampshire with the world, we need your support. Please consider joining the council as a member, if you aren't already, or making a donation in the box at the back of the room. Every dollar makes a difference. Now I'd like to introduce the guest for this evening's presentation on enterprise solutions to global poverty. A man who's been described as a visionary and is credited by the president of Rwanda as making the country among the safest and cleanest nations in the world since 1994. Michael Fairbanks began his global engagement as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya and followed with development projects in more than 35 countries since. He's founder and chairman emeritus of the OTF Group a strategy consulting firm based in Boston and the first venture-backed U.S. firm to focus on developing nations. He also co-founded the Seven Fund in 2005, which is a philanthropic foundation based in Cambridge, run by entrepreneurs whose strategy is to produce films, books, and original research to markedly increase the rate of diffusion of enterprise solutions to global poverty. He has been a senior advisor since 2001 to the president of Rwanda, and he co-authored Harvard Business School's landmark book on business strategy in emerging markets, Plowing the Sea, Nurturing the Hidden Sources of Advantage in Developing Nations, and edited In the River They Swim, Essays from Around the World on Enterprise Solutions to Poverty. He is currently spending the academic year as a fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. Those are just a few of his accomplishments. Please join me in welcoming Michael Fairbanks to the world. you to interrupt me right from the very beginning, you know, kind of push back a little bit. If you want to go this way, you know, talk about China's role in developing countries. If you want to hear about the miracle of Rwanda, which has lifted, a, announced last week, over a million people in the last 36 months out of poverty in one of the world's smallest and most remote countries. That's a really fun story to talk about. If you want to talk about U.S. foreign aid and what it's doing around the world, uh, I'm a pretty severe critic. I get very dour and unhappy very quickly when we talk about foreign aid. Um, and if we just want to talk about the kinds of things that you can do when you travel, when you study the world, uh, to try to make it a better place, we can go in that direction. So let me just start off with a few basic definitions and maybe a little framework that we can do. Oh, I'm sorry. If I hold that a little bit closer, that works? Okay, sorry about that. Do I need to repeat anything I just said? That's okay. Um, so I'm highly interruptible and I think we can customize this to the, the tastes and the needs of, of the group if, if we want to do that. But first, let's just talk about poverty. What is poverty? 
You know, there's lots of ways to define it. And if you brought in the world's greatest economists, if you brought in the top 50 people at the World Bank, and you gave them a survey and asked them what is poverty, I guarantee you they wouldn't agree on, on how to measure it, what it is, you know, what it looks like when you see it. Uh, and so it's very important to have a few working definitions of poverty. So just in an effort to engage you from the very beginning, does anybody want to just sort of shout out or help me with a synonym for poverty or a very simple definition of it? Uh, you know, what's poverty? What does it look like when you see it? Hopelessness. Hopeless. Ooh, you, see, you got right. That's my kind of final answer, and you just <laughs> just kind of destroyed my whole riff on this. Maybe we'll go back to the lecture format and forget about the. <laughs> but that that's excellent. Hopelessness. I mean, a lot a lot of people, when they define it, <clears throat> the the World Bank defines it as less than two dollars a day income. But that's not really a great definition because in some countries $2 a day is a little bit of money and in some countries it's a lot of money. And so a better way to think about it is in terms of the purchasing power of that person. If you can buy nutrition for your family, if you can buy medical care for your family, and if you can buy education and shelter for your family for only $2 a day, you're not really poor by the standard you grow up in. But if you live in Manchester and you're making $2 a day, you know, you're fairly, in, you know, you're in trouble. So a better definition than GDP or, or pure income is purchasing power because it takes into account the relative ability to create shelter, nutrition, medical care, and education for your family. But really, I think the best definition is the one that you offered a minute ago that poverty destroys hopes and aspirations. You know poverty when you speak to somebody, no matter where they are in the world, and they're in their survival stride, right? They can't get out of the idea of making it through the day. So they have no feeling that they can make their lives better, let alone the lives of their children or their family better. And so, Poverty destroys hopes and aspirations. And the reason we don't tend to think of it that way, and I'd be fascinated maybe afterwards to find out why you thought of it that way so quickly, is because the, the economists shape the terms of the discourse around poverty and economic growth. They're kind of the priestly caste of people who decide these things. And even though the World Bank has 14,000 people affiliated with it, and 4,000 of them have PhDs, only 400 of them are really trained well in, 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 in domains like sociology and anthropology. So what I guess I'm saying is people who are perhaps better equipped or more skilled to understand the human condition actually have very little role in these global governance systems. And so what you find is very narrow, very linear definitions of poverty instead of something that's more interesting, more robust, or more humane, like the theory or the, or the, the, the study of a group's aspirations. It's very important to keep this in mind as we go forward. In fact, it turns out that there are at least eight different domains of human understanding that opine about poverty. And the salient feature of these eight, and I hope I can remember the eight, I'll build some tension here to see if Michael Fairbanks gets to all eight. The, 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 the salient feature of this is that the group, that each group hardly ever understands any of the seven other groups. And so one of the features of development work is you have the economists over here and the sociologists over here and the political scientists over here. They're not talking to each other. In fact, they have great disdain for one another. And so they're not really learning from each other. And therefore, they're not building the masterpiece of integration that is required to actually solve the problem.
you, you all know Rudyard Kipling's idea of the blind men feeling opposite ends of the elephant, right? You know, the idea that one blind man is in front of the elephant, he feels the trunk of an elephant, he says the elephant is long and squirmy and fleshy, and another blind man is feeling the tusks of the elephant, he says an elephant is hard and sharp. Um, I actually had the opportunity years ago, I, I tell this story in this book over here, of how I got to convey that story to Nelson Mandela, the first time I ever met him, the year leading up to his presidency. And he was complaining to me about how he couldn't get the government and the private sector to work together. And I said, oh, they're like the blind men feeling the opposite ends of the elephant. He said, what? I said, they're the blind men, you know, Kipling's blind men feeling the opposite ends of the elephant. He said he didn't know the story, so I told him the whole story. And he said, wow, I hate to think what part of the elephant I'm used to feeling. <laughs> Mandela never disappointed. He's such a great gentleman. Super tall. Surprises you how big he is. Funny, punctual, such a nice person. That very same week when I was meeting with him, he took me back to his home in Soweto and we were talking and he got tired and he said, um, would you mind if I uh, took a nap and then we can resume our conversation? I said, absolutely, you know, whatever you want. You call him Madiba. Madiba was his the name of the, his uh, ethnic group. And once you got to know him, you didn't call him Mr. President, you didn't call him Mr. Mandela, you called him Madiba. And I said, absolutely, Madiba. And he said, oh, thank you very much. And then he lied down on the couch in front of me and took a nap and I just sat there <laughs> watching him sleep. Very uncomfortable. Um, but this is, this is what the political scientists, the economists, the sociologists are like. They're like the blind men feeling opposite ends of the elephant. So maybe one of the things I could share with you today is what are these sort of eight groups? What are their eight definitions? And give you a kind of sense for why we're not solving the problem. And it would also perhaps be interesting because each one of you probably falls into one or two of these groups, but certainly not eight of them. So let's do that for a second. The first group is the macroeconomists. And somebody keep count, see if I can get to eight. The macroeconomists, right? So this would be like the famous Jeffrey Sachs. How many people know Jeff Sachs' name? Okay, so this is one of those groups. Everybody studies and reads and pays attention to international affairs, good. Jeff Sachs is a macroeconomist. And He's, you know, varied in his opinions over a 30-year period, and he's a little bit inconsistent, and he's very compassionate, very self-righteous. He's kind of a difficult guy, but he's also probably the smartest, hardest-working guy in the whole field of alleviating poverty. And a macroeconomist really believes four things. Stabilize, privatize, democratize, and liberalize. Now, I've just taught you everything you need to know about macroeconomics. Liberalize your trade regime, stabilize your economy, democratize or decentralize your decision making, and privatize your productive assets. And a macroeconomist thinks that if you do those four things right, that you create the environment where innovation can occur and where really good things can happen, where companies can thrive, employ people, and poverty gets alleviated. The problem is, it's too linear, it's too simple, and it doesn't work. There's plenty of places in the world that have done those four things, stabilize, privatize, democratize, liberalize, and haven't shown good results at all. So it, it, it's really part of the answer. It's not the whole answer. But if you ask people at this institution, trained in economics, and there's probably one or two of you in here, they tend to think that that's how the world works. It's only part of the explanation. So let's do the second group, the microeconomists. Now, a microeconomist believes essentially in firm level issues, supply and demand issues, you know, business strategy issues, the idea that the subtle accumulation of many events adds up to a, a big economy. We might think of this microeconomics domain or this business strategy domain. Maybe the person we could think about is Michael Porter. 
He's the esteemed professor of business at Harvard Business School, and he says, firms compete, not nations. So when you take lots of these events at the national economic aggregates and you try to manipulate things at that level, you can't do very much. Things happen at the level of a company. Company builds a product. Company lo lowers its cost structure. It pays taxes. It employs people. And people take their salary and they go home and they build the shelter, the nutrition, the medical care for their families. And that's how it works. And that's the level at which we need to fix things. So that's the micro-economist, the microeconomics or business strategy domain. A third one could be the institutional domain. Douglas North won a Nobel Prize in 1990, and he said institutions are norms of behavior. And inside this institutional domain, we find the political scientists, we find lawyers, we find the people that think about transparency issues, anti-corruption issues, and they say things like, if we could just get the rule of law correct, then everything else would, would happen. Hernando de Soto famously wrote a book called The Other Path and the Mystery of Capital. He says, if we just get the rule of law correct, where institutions start to work, then everything else will work. So even after just these three domains, you're seeing the problem, right? The macroeconomist and the microeconomist don't fundamentally look at the world the same way. Lawyers, political scientists, they don't look at the world the same way as either of the economists. So let's do a fourth one. Let's do knowledge capital. This would be a group that believes in the idea that knowledge and insight, archives of information, international patents, libraries and databases is the ultimate store of wealth in a world that's moving into the digital economy. And so what we find with this group is very much the idea that we've moved out of the old economy into the new economy Subsoil assets aren't very important. It's what you know. And the difference between this group and the human capital group, which is the next group, this group believes that knowledge capital and human capital are similar, but human capital is skills and abilities. It's knowledge capital with legs. It can leave the room. It can get on a plane and fly away. This is about brain drains out of developing countries. And the greatest quote in the history of economic development comes out of this domain. It's by a Nobel laureate named Gary Becker who said, the only investment with the possibility of infinite returns is the investment in children. That if we got education right, if we invested in our children correctly, then we would be creating wealth. The only investment with the possibility of infinite return is the investment in babies. It's a great great line. It's the greatest line. But again, it's only part of the story. So how many is that so far? About five? So we've got three more. The first one of the three is the basic factor school. These are the people who believe that wealth is subsoil assets. It's location. It's sunshine. So if you have an awesome amount of oil, then you're a wealthy country. So you go to Venezuela and you say, you have an awesome amount of oil, but you still have a lot of poverty. How do you have so much oil and poverty? And they say, well, it's because we're corrupt. <laughs> and so I say to the president there, no, it turns out you're poor and corrupt, not rich and corrupt, but you're corrupt because you think you're rich. So you compete for government favors. You compete for, you compete for monopolistic access, access to government favors, markets, and subsoil assets. And that fosters the corruption. But if you thought you were poor and there was nothing to compete for, then you might do some of the other things correctly. I mean, even in the United States, we have this really interesting situation where the United States isn't a nation of one economy, 
it's a nation of many economies, right? You have the Boston, Manchester metropolitan area, which is very much based on insight and complex exports and software and biotech and media and uh, medical stuff. Almost anything we sell from this region globally, you can bounce off a satellite dish or it can buy a ticket and go on an airplane and go sell consulting services, right? And yet you go to West Virginia, you go to Montana, you go to Oklahoma, go to Louisiana, all they have is subsoil assets and most of the people are poor. And it gets even more interesting if you double click on the notion of Louisiana where we protect the sugar industry, protect some of the textile producers, everything we protect we turn into poverty. And I was advising the president of Brazil once in a World Trade Organization negotiating round with America and he said, tell me why you keep insisting that you want to help the poor countries of the rest of the world and then you protect American industries where we can compete and eradicate poverty. And I said, no, 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 turn it around. When you say to the American, don't go to the Americans this, and say, stop protecting these valuable industries in which we can compete and finally eradicate our own poverty. Don't say that. Americans don't wake up every morning worried about Brazil. Most people don't, in America don't know where Brazil is. We're still going to go on vacation this year no matter what happens in Brazil. We're still going to wake up on Christmas morning and give each other presents no matter what happens in Brazil. The sentimentality argument won't work when you see the President of the United States say, we're very interested in Brazil in why everything you protect turns into poverty in that region that you protect the textile workers in the south and they become poor. You protect the sugar workers in the south and they become poor. When in fact competition fosters innovation, competition spurs human initiative and America is a great role model for that when it comes to Silicon Valley, Route 128, our entertainment industry. Why do you insist on creating poverty in your own country? That's the question you ask the Americans. And that's what will get them to begin thinking about how to not protect those industries anymore so Brazil, with real cost advantages, can compete in those sectors and, and create a better situation. Number seven, the human science domain. The human science domain. We did human capital and we did knowledge capital. But there's a domain that I call human science. This one is the one you never really hear about, but in the future will be perhaps the most interesting. What's a human being, right? We have stereoscopic vision, so we have depth perception because both eyes are slightly off kilter. We have opposable thumbs, so we can make tools and hold things. We are bipedal and we stand erect so that we can move around and use our arms to hold things at the same time. We have a modular brain, a metaphorical part of our brain, primitive part of our brain, you know, things that work, um, you know, automatically and things that are highly cognitive. And because we're so unique compared to any other animal, we produce a unique sort of economics of cooperation, of tool making, of long-term planning. Well, what we're finding out is that it turns out that even entrepreneurs may be born and not made. Every human being has the same set of receptors on their brain, but depending on where the receptors are situated may actually increase your propensity to take risks, be generous, and to trust people all traits that are highly correlated with successful entrepreneurs. It turns out that we might be able to give a test to each person in this room someday and say this is the row of real rational risk takers. This is the row of people who don't like to take risks. These are the people that like to cooperate and trust people. These are the people who don't trust anybody at all. And be able to select them for a, a type of exposure 
that would promote entrepreneurship. Scary stuff. It's got all kinds of implications, right? All kinds of scary social implications. But science may lead us there at some point because it turns out that every society probably has a similar distribution of people who take risks and don't. Although we're finding out as we do more of this DNA research and genetic research that about one in four people in the United States of America possess a genetic propensity for taking rational risks, whereas in Europe it's about one in four. Now that's not surprising because people who came to North America had to take a chance. As an immigrant nation, we were the ones who got up off our duffs, got on a boat, didn't know what was going to happen next, and loved every minute of it. The question was, was that cultural? Was that individual circumstance? Or, as it looks like it may be turning out, it was genetic. It was neurological. So this is the human science explanation for entrepreneurship. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, um, it's, uh, let me, yeah, U.S. versus Europe. It's, it's, it is one in four of Americans. I have to check the other one. Yeah, it's a lot less. Yeah, sorry about that. So that leaves the final domain, the eighth domain. What do you think it is? I mean, let's review them. Macro, micro, institutional basic factor, human capital, knowledge capital, how many is that, six? And human science. So what's the last one? Whoa, nice. That's actually, there's actually a, quite a robust theory of luck and spontaneous breakthroughs in the promotion of prosperity. It probably should be the ninth category. <laughs> it's not the one I'm looking for though. There's the eighth one. And I'll give you a clue. Einstein said people don't understand the water in which they swim, right? So it's the one domain that we swim in all the time and we never think of it this way. I'll give you another clue in a second. If, but what's the eighth domain? It's the one that helps you attach meaning to our lives. It's the one that gives us identity. What is it? Sorry? Social. Social, very close. In fact, social is, I would put over three or four of these, like the human capital, the knowledge capital, the institutional. Social is a kind of a category that takes in three or four of these. But you're, you're, you're getting what I'm after. Yes? Emotional? Emotional? No? Spiritual is part of the answer I'm looking for. So, mores is part of the answer. Culture. Thank you, ma'am. See, isn't it funny? It's really the one the audience never gets. And in some ways, it's the easiest one. Let's define it. Clifford Gertz, the great, great anthropologist who wrote about this in a book called The Interpretation of Culture. I even remember it's on page 89 of, of his, of his uh, hardcover book. He says, culture is how a group self-identifies, right, and attaches meaning to life, recognizes each other, but it's also how other people see that person identified and attach meaning to life, right? So, for example, you know, I could look around the room, a lot of people here kind of look like me, similar skin tone, similar accent, you know, I could imagine whether, you know, reasonable reasonably high probability that you and I, you know, have a similar ethnicity, similar education. We can tell how people dress, how they use language. We can identify fairly quickly that we're in similar cultures. You and I are a little bit different. I think we have similar educations, similar aspirations, but way different parents, right? And so you start to attach meaning to life that way. Three types of culture. Number one, there's the explicit articulation of culture, right? Music, fashion, statues, language, food. It's the stuff you can see and hear, right? 
The second type of culture is the norms of behavior, having to do with things like punctuality, what's right, what's wrong. You know, in, in German culture, there's a high value on punctuality, right? In Latin culture, low value <laughs> on punctuality. You want to know something really fascinating? I look, all over, I look at all the different academic research on this from the brain and sociology, anything I can find. And the highest correlated thing I can find with prosperity is punctuality. If you're a punctual person, you'll probably be well-to-do. If you're not punctual, you probably won't. If your country is not very on time, it's probably a poor country. If it's kind of on time, it's probably a wealthy country. And nothing else predicts growth more than punctuality. So I'm an advisor to many leaders over the last 25 years. And I could really take a shortcut. And instead of advising them on their macroeconomics policy, their firm building, private sector development, human capital issues, blah, 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 I could just say, Mr. President, why don't you just make a law that everyone has to be on time, or else they go to jail, or, they get, or you kill them. And then everyone will be on time and your country will grow. What's the matter with that? What, what, why won't that work? And, and if, you, if you know the answer to this, you have very many nuanced levels of understanding about what it takes to be prosperous. This is, this is the hardest question I'm going to ask. If I just forced the entire country of Rwanda to be on time, and by the way, Rwanda is a very punctual place. It's not like the rest of Africa. They all live in the mountains. It's a very conservative culture. They're always on time to everything, and that's one of the reasons they're one of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world. I get credit for my advice there, but, and I thank you for that, Anne, but I don't deserve it at all. The Rwandans are really special. I've learned a lot more from them than they have from me, um, and it's not fair that I get any credit at all. But what, it, what is it that makes punctuality highly correlated, and I'm using an academic term here, correlated with prosperity. And yet, if I made everyone be punctual, we wouldn't have a prosperous country. Excellent. That's part of it. No, I want more. I want more. That's, that's really important. Yes, ma'am. That's way deeper than I wanted to go. <laughs> That's so deep. Uh, now I'm not even going to be able to go to sleep tonight. It's because they, they make it important to be on time. Yeah, they attach value to that. But it's also organizational. I mean, when you're, when you're punctual, you know how to organize your nice. life to get, yeah. Excellent, excellent. I want to keep going this way. Yes. Yeah, and punctuality kind of represents. Oh, you're going to oh, get it. Oh, 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 the youngest person in the room is going to get it. It kind of represents an enthusiasm or a willingness nice. to be there. Nice. And if you make people be punctual yeah. or on time, it's kind of taking away that enthusiasm. The key word you used is represents. And I want to go ahead. I think we thrive on diversity. If everybody's punctual. Oh, that's interesting. How would you know? Because everyone's the same. <laughs> that's way too deep, also. And that's funny. That's really funny. That's like a Saturday Night Live skit. <laughs> she, she said that um, it's what punctuality represents. And she offered the illustration of enthusiasm. But I would say that's even more, it's, the key word is represents. Uh, let me get a few more comments. But, but if Loud. If you're forcing them, you're taking away free will. And then they don't. Nice. They have to be free will. Yeah, it definitely has to be self-motivated. Absolutely. Anything, anybody else want to say something else before I crack the case here? Uh, I think it's also um, about personality structure. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and that you were a psych major. <laughs> right? It's a personality structure. And, and I think some Loud. of these things are cultural. And, and, it, and as you said, like in, in certain places, people you know, uh, operate in a particular way, other places they don't. And I think it's an internalized sense of the way nice. the world works. Nice. I mean, that's what I think. No, that's excellent. I even like the way, the exact way you said it, internalized sense about how the world works. So you may see that in writing pretty soon, and you'll receive no credit whatsoever. Um, it, it, it's a really smart way to put it. More. 
It represents commitment. That's good. What else does it represent? Let's use the word that this young lady said. What else does it represent? Respect. Respect. Oh, I think we're on to it now. I think when you say the word represent, it gave us this. Okay, what else does it represent? What? Commitment, said right here, over there. Respect. Respect for other people's time. Self-respect. What else? It indicates an expectation that there will be value when you show up on time. Oh, that's really good. I'm definitely it. stealing that one. I never thought of that one before. That's that's good, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Let me just write that down, Marty. Yeah. Um, excellent comment. Th this, is the, this is the way to think about it. Punctuality is a proxy, this was your idea, a proxy for a number of other underlying values, like respect, like commitment, that are highly consistent with innovation. Right? The expectation that there will be value when you arrive and you get something done. The expectation that someone else will be there with you. I love that. That's it never came up before. It's the idea that you see the time value of money. It's the idea that you look into the future. That you respect other people's time that you have this expectation, commitment, self-respect, and respect for others. See, punctuality, per se, means nothing. If I can force it, as this lady back here indicated, if I force it, it means nothing. It's the idea that it's internally generated punctuality, it's, and it's not its own thing. It's a proxy for a number of other values. Now this goes back to my original comment. What macroeconomist in the world would ever think of this? None of them. Why not? Because they can't measure it. If they can't measure it, it's not valuable. But a sociologist, an anthropologist, perhaps a psychologist, they would be on this in a minute, except they don't have much to say in the discussion. So what's happening in development is there are at least these eight different important domains that if we performed a masterpiece of integration <coughs> across these domains, human capital, knowledge capital, the you know, neurology, the sociology of punctuality, and then stabilize, privatize, liberalize democracy. And we brought it all together. Now we have an answer for poverty. But the university system isn't set up to foster this discussion. PhDs aren't rewarded for integrative thinking. They're rewarded for researching what their mentors tell them to research, which is mostly to make them look good. Departments are set up in cones, silos. I, in my private foundation, I put out from time to time financial awards for academics to do certain things. And it, you know, not super amounts of money, but big enough to interest the Academy, $50,000, $100,000, if you would write this kind of research, do this kind of paper. So I put up a $50,000 award for any anthropologist and macroeconomist that would work together. That's all you had to do. You don't have to write a book, write a paper, you don't have to write anything, just work together. And then tell me what you did, and I'll give you $50,000 and you can split it any way you want. No economist was interested in $50,000 to even work with an anthropologist, and the anthropologist didn't believe it was real. <laughs> <laughs> because that's not how the academy works, and that's part of the problem. So what we need to do in a place like this is to train people in these domains, but, but incent them to break, f when they finally have mastered the domain, to break with it and take their toolkit from one domain into another domain and see what they come up with. And I think my whole career, I don't, I don't have a PhD. In fact, I, I have three degrees, and this might explain everything. I have a degree in philosophy from a Jesuit university. I have a degree in biochemistry, and I have a degree in African politics. And then I gave all that up, and I went into banking. <laughs> and 
And so I don't have an allegiance to one domain, so I could take the best ideas wherever I found them and try to put them together. And that's how innovation occurs. In fact, the notion of genius, as explored by Howard Gardner at Harvard, is the idea of taking a toolkit from one place and applying it to a new field. He even suggests that the great geniuses in human history were either born in a rural area and moved to a city, or they were born in a city and moved to a rural area. Mm -hmm. That they grew up mastering one language and then wrote in a different language. That they trained in one domain and then solved the problems of another domain. And we're even seeing that with Nobel Prize winning economists now, where they're not actually economists anymore. Several of them have come from the domains of psychology over the last 15 years. It's very interesting what's going on. This is how poverty will be solved. Yeah. If money is not a sufficient incentive, and you can only speak to so many groups of people and use your power of persuasion, what becomes the incentive to make these people work together and solve the problem? The way, I mean, there's lots of theories of change, and I have two theories myself of how the world will get better. One is intergenerational change, where this young woman, how old are you? 17, 17 oh my gosh. It's like bedtime for you. <laughs> 17, I had no idea you were that young. She's going to think differently than I am automatically. She probably reads less books than I did. Maybe not, you seem kind of smart, maybe you read more, but her generation reads less books than I did. And, the, and they learn more from uh, social media, from uh, you know, video games, from travel, and things like that. So she already has different attitudes and values than I do. There's an intergenerational difference. And a lot of good will come just by allowing subsequent generations to think differently, automatically. But the other way that change occurs is through crisis. I mean, it's not a coincidence that Rwanda grows at 10% a year, that wages in the export sectors are growing at 30% a year, that there hasn't been a break-in in the entire capital city of Kigali in seven years, which is a lot more than you can say for the neighborhood we're in right now, probably. And this is the middle of Africa with no raw materials, no navigable rivers. You know, uh, you, you know this is an amazing place probably the great, greatest country in the world right now, in, in my view.